Let's move into another week of our four-and-a-half-year verse-by-verse journey through all of God's inspired Word by opening our Bibles to Matthew chapter number 28. Verse number 8 is where we're going to begin. As we continue the stories of Jesus' resurrection on the first day of the week after his atoning death on the cross the Friday before. Now, we know that uh, so far, uh, Jesus' tomb was being guarded by a contingent of Roman soldiers in the wee hours of the morning on Sunday, the first day of the week. And then suddenly an angel appears and they all faint dead away. And then when they wake up from that faint, Uh, either the body has already disappeared, leaving behind the grave clothes, or more likely, I believe, the angel is still there staring at them, and so they run away. And then the angel disappears. The angel did not open the tomb to let Jesus out. The angel's mission was to open the tomb to let the ladies in because that was one of the things they were concerned about as they approached the tomb very close to sunrise. When they did arrive and they saw the tomb open, they immediately went, and some of them at least, went inside. And what did they find? They found an empty tomb of a body, but still full of the grave clothes. And so I would suggest you just imagine that that grave wrapping that Joseph and Nicodemus had put together over Jesus' body, it's just collapsed, just collapsed. And then there's another piece of material somewhere off to the side by itself folded up or coiled up. And so that's what they saw. Mary Magdalene immediately assumes that the body has been stolen by the authorities. So that's what she runs off to report to Peter and John. And we told her part of the story last time we were together and how those two men ran off to the tomb uh, to check it out. And uh, we'll, we'll get back to what they saw in just a moment. But after Mary leaves, we are told that the other ladies were hanging around inside the tomb, perplexed, at what they're seeing, and that suddenly two angels are there, one at the head, one at the foot of the collapsed grave clothes. And the spokes angel tells them, basically, I know you're looking for. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. Why are you looking for the living one among the dead? Don't you remember what he told you? He said that he would be condemned and crucified, but he would resurrect on the third day and that he would then go ahead of everybody into Galilee. Come, you can come and look at the place where his body lay, but after you see that, you go, you tell Peter, you tell the apostles, he is resurrected just as he said, and he's going ahead of them, ahead of you, into Galilee. So that's what they were told. Uh, They then ran out of the tomb. Uh, Matthew puts it this way, Matthew 28, 8. So they departed quickly from the tomb with great fear and joy and ran to tell his disciples. Mark agrees with that. They were scared and they left the tomb in haste. Now Mark does go on and say, that they uh, didn't talk to anyone to begin with. So the way I kind of picture it is they are like out of the tomb like a shot uh, after the angel finishes telling them their responsibility. And they go maybe a little ways away and they have to stop and think about it and talk about it. Now, while they were doing that, Mary has probably by then reached wherever the apostles are at. I don't get the impression that they're back to Bethany uh, on the Mount of Olives. They seem to have stayed in town, perhaps at the upper room. 
Uh, but Mary has reported uh, what she believes, and John and, uh, and Peter are on their way back. Then this happens. This is Matthew 28, 9. Behold, Jesus met them. So Jesus' first appearance as the resurrected Lord and Savior is to the ladies before they get to the apostles. This is probably to reinforce what they were just told by the angels to do because they're a little hesitant. They're a little worried. They're a little concerned about what's just happened. So Jesus meets them and says, Greeting! And they respond by coming up to him, and they took hold of his feet, and they worshipped him. So they are down on the ground, grabbing a hold of his feet. They are so excited and happy to see him. So they recognize him clearly as Jesus. Mary will do something similar. She will also fall at Jesus' feet and hold on to him, and he's going to tell her to quit hanging on him. And we're going to talk about the distinction here. Uh, Jesus has no qualms with them touching him at this point. Uh, And so he said to them, do not be afraid. So what are they, what's their attitude right now? They're scared. They're scared at what they saw or didn't see in the tomb. They were scared by the angels. They are scared by the angel's message. And so Jesus appears to them and says, don't you dare be afraid. I want you to go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So here we have that re-emphasis of a message that Jesus has been repeating to his apostles for weeks, for probably about six months. He has told them, I am going to eventually go to Jerusalem. I will be betrayed. I will be put on trial. I will be terribly mistreated. I will be condemned, turned over to the Gentiles. The Gentiles will then crucify me, and I will die, but I will rise again on the third day, and I want you to meet me in Galilee. That was the intended plan. Every last one of these apostles should have been on the road by now. They should have been on their way back to Galilee in accordance with Jesus' command. But not a single one of the apostles have complied with that. So Jesus is reinforcing it through the women. I do not get the impression to begin with that Jesus intended to meet with any of the apostles on this first day of his resurrection. His intention was to meet them in Galilee. But because they're not budging, he sends, first of all, the women to them to tell them, get on the road. Now, while the ladies are on their way to wherever it is that the gentlemen are, that's when the rest of the story of the fainted Roman guard takes place. Matthew 28, 11. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests and all that had taken place. So they go and report to the temple authorities. It says specifically here, the chief priests. Now, we are aware historically that a lot of the priestly families, not all of them, but a lot of them, especially those in high leadership, were from the Sadducee side of the equation. So they didn't believe in the supernatural. And so for them to hear this story of an angel... Uh, and rolling back the stone and all of that, and the, and the body disappeared. Uh, these Sadducee types are not going to be interested in that. They're going to think that's flights of fancy. But if there were any Pharisees that were in this initial report, they would be a little bit nervous about it because they are the supernaturalists. They believe in supernatural events. And so to hear Roman soldiers professionals in the matter of security talking about seeing an angel and uh, fainting dead away and the body disappearing. That would have been problematic. And so they need to deal with this. 
as quickly as possible. Because the reason that Roman guard was there in the first place was to make sure that the apostles didn't grab the body and then claim the resurrection. Uh, So instead of the apostles claiming that he's risen from the dead, we've now got Roman soldiers saying, oh no, an angel appeared to us and that body disappeared. And so they need to do what they can to nip this in the bud. Verse 12, when they had assembled with the elders, so more members of the council, that would include some Sadducee or some Pharisees, and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers, i.e., they bribed them big time. Now think about the fact that minimally there would have been four soldiers plus a centurion, more than likely, on this detail. Could be eight or more plus the centurion on this detail. They are going to have to pay these guys enough bribe money that they will lie about a supernatural event that they witnessed with their own eyes. And not just lie about that, they need to risk their own lies, their own lives by what they're about to be told. Because this is what they told them. You need to tell the people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. Now, first of all, if they were asleep, how in the world would they know what happened? But second of all, it was often a capital offense to fall asleep on watch. At the very least, you'd get a very severe beating, perhaps even been drummed out of the service. But more often, you would be executed because you put everything at risk by falling asleep. And if you had an entire unit that fell asleep, that's really bad. And so by them testifying that they'd fallen asleep on watch was just asking to be executed. And so that's why the leadership of the Jews says, if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So don't worry. We know. We know that you could be in big trouble with Pilate if this story gets to him. But if it happens, we'll step in on your behalf. Now, now, are they suggesting that they will bribe Pilate as well? That's possible. Uh, irregardless, I'm not so sure these soldiers can trust these guys. Because honestly, think about it. Is it any skin off the nose of the members of this high council if a handful or a double handful of Roman soldiers are executed by the Roman authorities? I don't think so. In fact, it might actually solve their problem because dead soldiers don't talk about what happened to them on duty. And so I don't know that they can be trusted uh, to keep their promise here, but they made it. Uh, And so the soldiers, it says, took the money, did as they were directed, and this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now, Matthew is the one that wrote that down. Uh, I believe that Matthew probably, according to the traditions, wrote his gospel right before he left the area of uh, the Holy Land, that is of Judea and Jerusalem area, right around the mid-40s. So that's only about 12, 15 years after the events. And so Matthew says, this is the story that's still making the circuits at this time, 15 years later. It's a lie. It doesn't make any sense. But that's the story that a lot of people want to believe rather than to accept the fact that Jesus is resurrected from the dead. Now, the next thing that Matthew does is tell us about how uh, the apostles do end up in Galilee. Uh, They skip, uh, that is, he skips over a lot of the other appearances. And so I want to uh, get back to those. Uh, Now, we know that Mary Magdalene ran away without hearing anything from the angels. So she definitely wasn't there when Jesus appeared to the ladies. She ran and found Peter and the other apostle, seems to be John, 
told them, and they ran out to the tomb and uh, checked it out. They didn't see Jesus. They didn't see angels. They saw empty grave clothes. And John bears the testimony that he began to believe at that point in the resurrection. That's all in the Gospel of John. Uh, So when we go back to John chapter number 20, verse number 10, in reference to Peter and the other apostle, Peter and I think John, it says, Then the disciples went back to their homes. Now, that's not their homes in Galilee. It's referencing the place where they were staying at the moment Mary came and found them, very possibly the upper room. So Mary didn't run back in the company of Peter and John. If she did run, then she was well behind them. But John's gospel takes up the next part of Mary Magdalene's story in verse number 11 of John 20. It says that Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. So she is standing and weeping and wailing outside the tomb. But every once in a while, she kind of looks inside and verifies again, there is no body in those grave clothes. They're flattened out. They've collapsed. And she just keeps on crying about this. Verse number 12, at some point, something changes. She saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. So she's very close to the entrance. She's looking in. Nobody's come past her. One moment, she sees collapsed clothes. The next moment, there's two guys sitting in there. And they ask her a question. Uh, They say to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They've taken away my Lord. I don't know where they've laid him. And so her response to the angels totally different than the women had been there a few minutes earlier. Those women recognized there was something really off about these two guys suddenly appearing there in the tomb. And they were scared. They were terrified. Uh, But they were also kind of open to hear the message that the angels gave. Mary is not there. I don't know what she was thinking. She must have thought that she missed seeing these guys come past her and go in there, but she's not really engaging these two angels at all. She just continues her crying. Uh, Verse 14 says, having said this, she turned around. Now, why did she turn around? I don't know. Maybe she heard a little crunch on the gravel from sandaled feet. Maybe she saw a little shadow, you know, come up against the, the wall Uh, that uh, the tomb has been cut into, I don't know. But something made her look around. And what does she see? It says that she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Now, the ladies recognize Jesus, but Mary doesn't. Why? It could be as simple as the fact that her eyes are so blurred with her tears, that all she sees is a form, a shape. It could be that she didn't fully look at the person. She only sees maybe the feet in the bottom half of his body because she's looking down. But whatever the reason is, it says she did not know that it was Jesus initially. Jesus said to her the exact same words that the angels just did. Woman, why are you weeping? And then he goes on, whom are you seeking? Now, supposing him to be the gardener, that is the person that takes care of maybe the tombs in this area, or possibly just takes care of the garden itself, and the tomb just happened to be there. Remember, this is Nicodemus's tomb. 
excuse me, uh, Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. He made the arrangements to carve this tomb out of the side of the rock uh, in this particular garden for his own use. But Jesus needed it. And so this gardener, that's what she assumes, is someone that she could talk to. So she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. So she makes an assumption that perhaps maybe the gardener had objected to Jesus' body being laid in this tomb and had removed it in the intervening hours uh, since Friday uh, when they laid it there. And if he would just let her know where uh, he had taken the body, she would finish the burial service. And this is when Jesus reveals himself to her. Jesus said to her, Miriam, or Mary. And somehow the way he said her name, she recognized and she turned, which means that she'd apparently turned away from the, who she assumed was the gardener. She turned back to him, and she said in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Literally, it means my great one, my teacher. It's related to the word rabbi, uh, but it's an extended ending on it because of the Aramaic. And so... Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. Now, this is where we need to talk about the comparison, the contrast between Jesus' appearance to the ladies earlier and Mary's interaction with Jesus. It seems as if Mary does also grab a hold of him. And so Jesus says, do not cling to me. It's actually more of a don't keep clinging to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but we'll wait on that next part. I have not yet ascended to the Father. Now, some people have suggested she is being told by Jesus, you can't touch me because you'll make me unclean, and I need to go into the Father's presence as the, um, as the first fruits offering. Uh, one of the things we need to understand symbolically, prophetically, is that on this morning, the high priest, in another pomp and circumstance moment, will go into the fields outside of Jerusalem and, according to Jewish law, will cut a sheaf of barley grain and will carry that barley grain into the temple complex, into the temple building, and he will wave that first cutting of barley in front of the presence of God and thereby dedicate the entire harvest to God. This is the first fruits offering. Jesus fulfills that. Paul talks about Jesus being the first fruit offering. He is the one who, who has first been resurrected permanently from the dead. And some people have suggested that until Jesus fulfills that ceremony in some supernatural way, uh, he should not be touched. Um, but he allowed the women to touch him earlier. So I think that doesn't make good sense between these two passages. So I believe that what he's actually saying to her is, Mary, you've got to let me go. I haven't even ascended to the Father yet. Remember, he had told the apostles, and the ladies may have been there in the upper room as well, I have to go away from you, because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit cannot come. I must depart and then later, I'll come back and I'll take you to where I'm at and you can be with me forever. So I think that what Jesus is actually telling Mary is that she's got to get past this moment of grief over him. She's got to quit holding on so tight 
to his physical presence because he still needs to leave planet Earth. Then he gives her an assignment. Guess what? It's the exact same assignment that he gave the other ladies. He says, go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. So he wants Mary to go and tell the apostles that the resurrection has occurred. And that is exactly what she does. She complies. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord! And that he had said these things to her. Luke tells the story in this fashion. This is Luke 24.10. So all the ladies eventually come into the presence of the apostles. Mary Magdalene may have arrived shortly after the others. So it says, now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James. I believe that's Mary, the mother of Jesus. And the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Told what things? That Jesus has resurrected from the dead. Angels told us to come and tell you to meet him in Galilee. In fact, Jesus himself appeared to us and told us to tell you he's resurrected from the dead and he wants you to go to Galilee just like he told you and meet him there. So the first resurrection appearance was to the ladies. And the first unbelievers of the gospel story are the apostles. Luke 24, 11. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. That is some pretty sad commentary right there. Now, when we come back tomorrow, we will talk about the two gentlemen on the road to Emmaus who were graced with the presence of the Lord.